Hi folks, welcome to uh, the second lecture. Um, I recorded this yesterday and Zoom crashed on me, so I'm, I'm trying it again, so we'll see how this goes. I'm going to share the screen with you. We're gonna finish up um, the PowerPoint presentation. Today we're gonna to talk mostly about neuroplasticity in the brain and some ideas on how to improve changes in the brain. So I'm gonna to go to share screen. Share screen, there we go, Microsoft PowerPoint, share, and full screen. All right, this is where we ended. We summarized this just as a quick reminder. There's a lot of data out there for not only the physiological, but the psychological benefits of the concept of mindfulness, reduce social anxiety, stress, fatigue, depression, um, there's been a lot of work with substance abuse and working with incarcerated substance abusers in the prison system that is becoming fairly mainstream. Increase in, in executive function, mindfulness, pain tolerance. That was why John Kabat-Zinn in many ways initially started in 1979 was to put into the hospital system um, a way for those that could not be capable of ameliorating their pain through uh, medication. Sense of well-being, empathy, and compassion. You'll notice there's a couple words that you don't see up here because there's not been almost any data on this, and that is in the classroom. Yet, if you go online and do a quick search, you'll find dozens of instructors from kindergarten to college going, oh my goodness, my students are performing better. But there hasn't been a lot of real hardcore studies on that. But you will find some stuff online for that as well. Okay, so now we're going to discuss a little bit about the concept of neuroplasticity. And this is the idea that the brain is a malleable plastic structure that can change under the right conditions. It can also change under the wrong conditions, and I'll briefly mention that in a minute as well. Um, but how do we increase the function of the brain? And neuroplasticity refers to the multiple structures of the brain and nerves that result from changes in neural pathways and synapses. For those of you that aren't familiar, a synapse is simply the space in between one neuron connecting to another. These changes stem from changes in behavior, environment, neural processes, as well as changes from bodily injury. And the brain does change throughout life. If you picked up a textbook from 25 years ago, it would tell you that the brain is fixed by somewhere around 10 to 13 years of age. I have an MRI sitting somewhere on my computer of an 88 year old female showing neurogenesis in the brain. But, it can also change in not always the best way. And here's a paper from 1962 that was redone in 1999, um, where, and this is the cross section of the insular cortex, where they had to control rats and then they put rats on a running wheel. And those black dots are neurogenesis, are growing neurons. So the fact that this is a very, very real phenomenon is simply no longer disputed. What is not well understood is how we do this. Okay, positive outcomes of neuroplasticity, new skills. People are learning motor skills and language skills um, and cognitive skills through neuroplasticity. And this has been shown here is part of the orbital frontal cortex, part of the brain that I'm actually working on, on the right side especially, uh, that appears to be enlarged due to meditation. Um, improved function of the aging brain, this has become a big deal. And we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. Slowing down pathological processes, we talked about that last time. Um, there are a number of of pathologies that can be shown to be reduced through mindfulness-based practices. 
promoting recovery of sensory losses. That's an interesting one. Improved motor control. And you guys probably have all heard this before. You know, think of your high school track coach. Think about yourself, whatever, jumping in the long jump or pole vaulting. You can actually increase the growth of the brain by cognitively thinking about it and improve memory. And we know that people who consistently meditate have a singular ability to cultivate positive emotions, retain emotional stability, and engage in mindful behavior. So if we re replace positive emotions, retain emotional stability, and engage in mindful behavior with the word performance in the classroom, I think we can agree that that pretty much says it all. The observed differences in brain anatomy might give us a clue why meditators have these exceptional abilities. And that is from if you haven't seen sciencedata.com, it's a beautiful, beautiful website that kind of collates all sorts of work. So there are negative outcomes, decline in brain function, altered motor control, impaired performance, and an amplified perception of the pain under some circumstances. But if we don't do negative components, then as this says below, as much as half the risk for developing Alzheimer's disease and late life cognitive problems could be due to lifestyle choices and behaviors. And whether we engage in cognitive activity like puzzles is very much on that list. Crossword puzzles, Sudoku, Kindle, reading. If you keep the brain active, it's going to stay active. And that is not disputed. Here is a beautiful summary of a brilliant human being, Donald Hebb. And in 1949, he published a book called The Organization of Behavior. And he talked in there about the structural changes in the brain. He said, let us assume that the persistence of repetition, repetition of a reverberatory active activity tends to induce lasting cellular changes. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells, such as A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. It's what I tend to talk about probability. If one cell fires, the probability of the second one is going to increase if it's consistently um, activated. And Donald Hebb very famously said, nerves that fire together, wire together. And these structural changes can occur in synaptic plasticity. We know the synapses can change. We know we can grow more synapses through synaptogenesis. We know we can increase the growth of actual neurons. And neurogenesis, we've already talked about, and controlled neurocell death, that sometimes the ones that we don't use, we don't want to keep around. All right, so circuit training. We go to the gym, we exercise our muscles, they get bigger. By exercising our muscles by default, we're strengthening the bone and they get stronger. It's not tremendously illogical to think, what if we can do the same thing for the brain? And so here's what I'm proposing, that we can remodel the brain based on heavy and learning upon experiences of repetition, correct fundamentals, doing it the right way in an authentic environment. And that authentic environment can be anywhere. It can be out in the woods next to your favorite waterfall. It could be in your home or it could be in a classroom. So we exercise on a circuit, why not exercise the brain? And for this, if I say the word healthcare provider, what I'm really meaning is almost anybody who works with people. I tell my health professional students, I'm not going to teach you to be a healthcare provider, I'm gonna teach you to be an educator. Because what do nurses and PAs and OTs and PTs do? They're educating. So if I say healthcare provider, um, I mean educators. The psychological benefits to that person who is doing that education, we have a reduced burnout, reduced response to stress, reduced rumination and depression, increased emotional regulation. 
the well-being of the client, and of course by client I mean patient or student, increased compassion, increased attention and memory, <clears throat> excuse me, decreased judgment, <clears throat> reduced errors. I, I think I told you on the last one, I don't remember, I taught a, a workshop every Wednesday at noon, which in my opinion is the perfect time to do it, for the physician assistant program. And out of 72 students, nine of the top 10 academic performers were in that workshop. Now, that's probably a confirmation bias. They probably would have been nine of the top 10 regardless. So we haven't actually done the scientific experiment, but I think there's something to this. And I've read too much online of uh, teachers in the classroom who will spend five minutes after lunch or five minutes in the middle of the day and do that. And I, I, I showed you guys a very simple exercise um, for breathing and it can be done in as short as minutes and we'll see. So, individual interventions. Take time between your students for yourself. Breathe, walk. Um, walking meditation is a little difficult to demonstrate on Zoom, but I will try to find a link and show it to you. Eating meditation is also a little bit difficult to do on Zoom, but I'll find a link to show that to you as well. Find a place of refuge. It might be a chapel. Um, one of my favorite places is a beautiful, beautiful spot next to a waterfall down near my house. Or it could be a classroom. Your students are taking a test. You've got five minutes behind your desk. Recommit your intention. Why, remember that your students are why you entered the field. And the last one here is absolutely without a doubt my favorite. So we've talked a lot about oxytocin in my other classes. Um, it's oftentimes referred to as the hormone of pregnancy. It gets upregulated shortly after birth and it allows the milk to be released from the breast. But it turns out it's also a really powerful hormone that goes into certain parts of the brain for the reward center. And if you think about it, that makes sense because if we're, dumping oxytocin so that the kid can suckle and get milk. And if the mom is getting the reward center activated going, look, this is cool, I'm taking care of my kid, that's beautiful. So they did a beautiful experiment um, and they found out in humans, if you pet a dog, that oxytocin levels rise, it activates your reward center. And that's fascinating, but then they did in my opinion, what was even more interesting is then they took blood samples from the dog. And sure enough, oxytocin levels went up. So think about this next time you're petting your dog or your cat or your rabbit or your snake, um, that you're increasing happiness in both. All right. And if we get stressed, just remember to take a pause and breathe. Burnout, whether it's in the classroom or in a healthcare profession, um, showed that mindfulness decreases burnout significantly. Self-compassion is a powerful moderator of elements associated with burnout. Self-compassion is an interesting concept of mindfulness that we can explore some other time. Um, and it's, it's, it's more of a we're all compassionate for our students. We're sometimes not as compassionate for ourselves. And we need to do both of those. Um, it's been shown, especially in first responders, firefighters, EMTs, these sort of things, it's significantly reduced stress and burnout. And it's not been studied heavily with teachers, but um, I think it will be soon. Okay, we're gonna summarize here for a minute. Consistent decreases in perceived stress, fatigue, and factors. Uh, perceived stress, notice it said perceive. We're gonna come back to perception here in just a minute. We're almost done. 
increases in emotion regulation, well-being, and self-control. And there is a lot of research on this, but it's interesting if you look at those dates, they're almost all 2000s. This is kind of new stuff here. I'm not gonna waste your time because 99% of you are gonna be bored with this. If you want to know more about the neuroanatomy of this, please get in contact with me because these are the areas that I'm currently studying, the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, even though that picture is the left uh, prefrontal cortex. Um, executive function, executive attention, awareness of yourself and awareness for others. And it's been shown that mindfulness actually grows gray matter. Right insular cortex, which is right down in here, it's kind of behind all the rest of the cortex. Um, empathy and insight, and it's been shown that the cellular regulation for empathy actually increases with mindfulness. And then we get down to the inside of the amygdala, which is down in here, the prefrontal lobe, which is right up here, and the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is sitting right there. Responds to threat, controls emotion, and mindfulness reduces the volume of the amygdala for threats but increases the anterior cingulate and prefrontal lobe. And if you want to know more about neuroanatomy or shoot, if you want to come take a look at some brains, just get hold of me and we can, we can do that at some point. Uh oh, um, practicing brings familiarity, practicing the cycle of focusing, wandering, awareness that your brain has wandered and then bringing it back to attention. And bringing it back to attention is the moment of mindfulness. Start with two minutes, start with five minutes. Eventually it will increase. Um, and I have found in the classroom, uh, five minutes to 10 minutes works really well for many, many students. Um, <clears throat> so summarize, meditation has been linked to cortical thickness and the density of gray matter. We know that. Um, much of the hardcore neuroscience was really started in the early 90s. Richard Davidson uh, was, well, he still is, he's still doing his research. Study, he studied fear and anger, and he ran into the Dalai Lama, I don't know how, and the Dalai Lama said, why don't you study happiness? And the Dalai Lama went, okay, I'm sorry, Richard Davidson said, okay. And he started the first MRIs. Um, but he was working with folks that had over 34,000 hours of meditation training. Um, so it's a little bit different from normal folks. And I'm trying to put it into the general practice, as is many, many people around here. Um, and here's just a random paper that I pulled out, the effect of meditation on cognitive function in aging and neurodegenerative diseases. So they're putting this into Alzheimer's classes and... They're also doing things as far as Lou Gehrig's disease, they've shown effects of this. And here's a quote from that paper, meditation can be a potentially suitable non-pharmacological intervention aimed at the prevention of cognitive decline. And this is important. However, the conclusions of these studies are limited by their methodological flaws and differences of various types of meditation techniques. So what we're doing right now in our work is we're trying to get through the methodological flaws. We're going to be using quantitative electroencephalography and the differences of various types of meditation techniques. We're going to stick to um, what's called Vipassana or attention to breath, because I think in my experiences, that's the easiest one to put in the classroom. Um, it, was, it was easy to, to get first graders laying down with a stuffed animal on their chest, counting to three as that stuffed animal went up in the air, meaning they're inhaling, and then back down on the count of three when they're exhaling. And we never used the word inhale and exhale. And I was absolutely stunned how easy it works. So it can be done in the classroom. You can introduce more scientific later on with the later high school students, and I've done it in college quite a bit. And then we're going to wrap it up with the idea of perception versus reality. 
and you're going to have access to this, so feel free to steal this because I stole it. Um, with mindfulness, we talk about perception versus reality. There might be a reality that that chronic pain is still there. But what if we could affect the perception? And that's been shown what we're doing. So I'll give you a stupid example. Um, I, I love to do card tricks and I teach my kid card tricks. So pick a card, study it, remember it. Now don't forget your card. And through the power of Zoom, I'm gonna make your card go away. Usually when we're fooled, the mind hasn't made a mistake. It's come to the wrong conclusion for the right reason. All right. You guys are already accomplished mindfulness practitioners. Um, and if you're into yoga, coolest downward dog ever. And if you have questions, you can't ask them now, but you could certainly email them or contact me. And I'd be delighted to chat. And one of these days, when we return to normal, maybe we can all get together in person and talk about this. All right.